Hey, good morning and welcome to Calvary Arlington Online. I uh, want to welcome you who are watching on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we are happy you are here with us this morning. Uh, please uh, make sure and like our Facebook page, subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, so that you can get notifications about future uh, studies as we do them. Uh, but we are thankful that you're here and uh, again, feel free to make comments or ask questions. Uh, we'll try to get to those uh, through the week. So today, we are launching into a new study. Um, it's not really a series in the sense of a topical series, but we're beginning the book of Hebrews, which is, uh, it is an awesome, uh, a bit of a daunting task for a pastor because it is, it's not only long, uh, but it's filled with just all kinds of uh, doctrinal information. It's a, it's a mystery. Hebrews is a mystery in the New Testament, and it kind of stands alone in one sense uh, because there is no uh, clear indication who wrote it, right? Uh, a lot of the New Testament, it's very, very clear who wrote it. Paul wrote this, Peter wrote this, John wrote this, etc. Here, there's no indication other than speculation. There's been a lot of different speculation. I personally try to avoid uh, speculative things like that because it's of no value, right? We could, we could speculate all, all day long about who wrote it, uh, but we don't know other than what is clear is that it is the Word of God, right? It is the Word of God. It's a beautiful letter. Uh, we also don't know to whom it was written. So that's not uh, entirely clear. Uh, it's been called the letter to the Hebrews um, only because of what is, you know, what is contained within it um, in regard to the Jewish uh, religious history and themes. So it is evidently written with a, a Jewish reader uh, in mind, that is a Jewish Christian reader in mind, uh, and it kind of bridges... Uh, the gap, or it, for, it serves as a bridge uh, between the Jewish religion and the Christian message of salvation in Jesus. Over and over uh, throughout the letter, we find a comparison of sorts between uh, the Old Testament concepts and modes and ministries uh, versus the ministry of Jesus, right? In, and in each and every comparison, there is between the Old Testament uh, way of doing things or thinking or the Jewish religion. And, and when it's uh, presented in contrast with Jesus, in every case, Jesus is uh, presented as completely superior. And that's kind of thematically, that is, in a, in a nutshell, it's the superiority of Jesus Christ, the eternal king. And so it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, lesson. It's a wonderful letter, a wonderful study. The first 10 chapters are heavy in doctrine. Uh, the revealing of Christ as being better, better, um, better than those Old Testament programs. He's presented as being superior uh, to the revelation from the prophets, uh, superior uh, to the revelation through angels. He's superior in uh, uh, comparison to the ministry of the servants Moses and Joshua, as well as he's presented uh, as superior to the Levitical priesthood, the sacrifices, and the temple worship. Actually, in all of those cases, he's a fulfillment of all of those things, which were a mere shadow of what was to come. The second half of the letter is more practical, of course, uh, it contains one of the most important chapters in the New Testament, I think, one of my favorites. And I can't wait to get there. Of course, it's going to be some time before we get to chapter 11. Uh, but in chapter 11, we see this great chapter in regard to faith, uh, both uh, in history, but then also it just kind of gives us this idea of this is what faith looks like. Uh, this is what faith looks like in a very practical way as we follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and then throughout the letter, throughout the letter, there is this idea that's repeated that we as believers need to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ and actually saying that exact thing. We need to fix our eyes on Jesus, who is better. Um, there is a strong warning 
contained uh, in the letter, uh, woven throughout the letter, which gives us the idea that whoever wrote it, whichever one of the apostles wrote it, uh, there was a great concern that they had, uh, that the church, that the people in the church could drift away, that they could fall into unbelief, um, literally falling away uh, through some other, you know, some other religious thought, some other religious teaching, or even through what the author calls willful sin. Um, and so as we look at that, um, those are dangers that existed then, and those are certainly transferable things to today. All of those dangers uh, exist today. They are constant threats throughout the church age. Certainly, um, I would think now, even in the present immediate circumstance we find ourselves in, all those things are concerns that we all should have as well, uh, that people could drift away from the faith, that people could uh, fall into some kind of unbelief, falling away even into willful sin. So it's an important, a uh, very important study for the church. And I'm, again, I'm excited to begin and I'm thankful for you being here with us. Uh, so let's pray and we'll get started. Father, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your word that uh, speaks to us, even as it spoke to the original hearers in the, at the time that this was written. Uh, so long ago, it, it has spoken to the church throughout the ages, and it speaks to us today. And so, uh, God, we pray uh, that you would speak to us this morning by your spirit, whether we're watching this in real time or we're watching it sometime after. Uh, no matter, we trust your Holy Spirit to uh, make application. We want to just open our hearts to what the Holy Spirit would say to us as we take in your word once again. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we are going to read Hebrews chapter 1. Follow along with me. I'm assuming you have your Bibles out. You should. Uh, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom... Also, he made the world, and he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature, and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much better than the angels as he has inherited a more excellent name than they. Verse 5, for which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be a father to him and he shall be a son to me. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and ministers a flame of fire? But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. Verse 9, you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they all will become old like a garment, and like a mantle you will roll them up. Like a garment they will also be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not come to an end. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Now, if you're reading your text, you see over and over again from verse 5 on so much of that. They're all Old Testament quotes. And so you see how, how the writer here is bringing to bear those things from the Old Testament into an explanation of Jesus Christ. He's pointing over and over to Jesus Christ. 
He's better. He says, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways. Here's, here's the kind of the opening salvo, the opening line. God has spoken. Right? This is the revelation of God. God has spoken. And he says, in many portions, in many ways. Um, here's the thing. God has spoken over and over and over again. It's one of the wonderful things about being a Christian, about the foundation that we have in the scriptures and the heritage that we have as Christians looking back at the history of the Jews. We see over and over since the beginning of time, God has spoken. Our God has spoken, right? Since creation, God has spoken. Over and over and over again, he's uh, spoken in creation. He spoke through the patriarchs, right? He, he, he spoke through the prophets. He spoke through the priesthood. He, he, anyone who says, oh, God's silent, are you kidding me? He continues to speak. Romans chapter 1 tells us how he continues to speak through creation. Our God, it's almost as though God through the ages has been screaming his message. Over and over and over again. And this is, this is where the writer, he just begins. He says, God, he has spoken in the past. And I, I would just say, he's spoken clearly. Right? He has spoken clearly through all of these things. And, and, and everything that he wanted to say, communicating his nature and his purpose, all of those things, I would say, have been effectively communicated. They've been effectively communicated. Now, now, the things break down, right? Things break down when you take a verse out of the law and say, oh, what about this? Or, or you, you look at maybe the study in the book of Joshua and you say, oh, what about this? Well, I would just say that's an improper way uh, to study the scripture. It's also an improper way uh, to come to a conclusion about someone's nature and someone's character. Uh, I mean, just think about it. How would you like someone to take a look at the totality of your life and then pick out some time that seems a little bit unexplainable. That thing that you did or that thing that you said without explanation and say, oh, well, there, that's who he is. That's, that's who she is. She did that one thing that one time. Therefore, that's who she is. We would hate that. Wouldn't, I would hate that. Right? I, I would certainly hate that. Now, we're fallen people. We're talking here about God. Right? And so God hasn't made any mistakes. He, he hasn't, he's without sin. He's without error. But if we're going to understand him, we need to see the totality. Right? We need to see the totality of what God has said throughout history. From the beginning of time uh, all the way through. Uh, even now, I would suppose. But, but certainly through the presentation of Christ. Now. We're not going to do that. I mean, the, the Hebrews, in essence, does that in a sense, going back over and over and over through all of these things in the Old Testament and explaining them and showing how Jesus is both the fulfillment and better than all of those things which were a mere shadow. But if you take the totality of all that, is God, that God has spoken in the past, um, it says one thing, really. Right? It, it says one thing. In, in the sense of trying to figure out what is, what is the message of God and who is God and what is he like. Now, there's a great line in Nehemiah. Of course, it's repeated a couple times in the Old Testament. But in uh, the book of Nehemiah, of course, it's, uh, Nehemiah is all about the restoration of uh, Israel or the restoration of Jerusalem specifically. And under Nehemiah and then Ezra, the spiritual leader, uh, the word of God, the city is being restored, but then also the word of God is being brought back in to prominence for the people of God. And in chapter 9, in the book of Nehemiah, in chapter 9, uh, the priests... Are, there's a oh, the whole, whole list of priests there listed. I'm not going to get into their names. Some of them are difficult to pronounce. Uh, but they, uh, they begin to uh, give, a, the, the, the people are assembled, and they begin to give a history lesson. Even going back to creation, they begin giving a history lesson for everything that God has done from the beginning of time until that moment. And it's a beautiful and accurate history lesson. Now, they get to a certain point 
that I think is just kind of uh, just very, very important and informs what we're talking about here in that how God has spoken in the past. Because as they go through that whole history lesson, they come to this line in verse 17 where they talk about the character and the nature of God. And they say this. This is Nehemiah 9, 17. You are a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. I, that is, right, if you're going to boil down everything that God has spoken in the past, from the beginning of time till that moment, and certainly now, that's who God is. That's how God has spoken in the past. And so be careful, friend. Be careful for anyone who would say, oh, well, what about this or what about that? No, take in, you have to take in the totality of all that God has said. This is who he is. This is the message. He's a God of forgiveness. He's a God who is gracious and he's compassionate and he's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. God has spoken and he's spoken to us in the past. He's spoken to the world in the past. We've got it here in the scriptures. Now, the writer, he takes, he fast forwards. He says, uh, God, he spoke long ago in all these different ways, in all these many ways in these last days, which by definition, we would just have to say the last days is what we call the church age, right? It's it's the, the time of Christ until the present time. This is the church age. And so that's what's being referred to in these last days. He simply says, in these last days, he's spoken to us in his son. So he makes a very clear distinction um, and a glorious one, wouldn't you say? Uh, he's spoken to us in Jesus. Now, there's so many verses that talk about this. John, in his gospel, he begins with this beautiful language in John chapter 1. You may be familiar with it. Uh, he says, in the beginning, now it's interesting now, he goes back to the very beginning, the creation. He says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Clearly what John's writing about is Jesus Christ. He's writing about a person. He calls him a he. He calls him here the logos. He's the logos. He's the word of God. Has God spoken? Absolutely he's spoken. He's spoken through the logos, through the word, which is Jesus Christ. Now he goes on. John chapter 1 verse 14. He goes on and he says, and the word, he's describing Jesus here, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw his glory glory as of the only begotten from the father full of grace and truth notice notice here now John's writing this of course after the fact right he's he's given a history lesson having walked with Christ having learned from Jesus uh, being now filled with the spirit and having knowledge and wisdom and understanding. He goes back and he says, man, Jesus Christ, the savior that we followed, he's the word. He's the word of God and he became flesh and he lived with us and we saw him. And notice what he says. We saw his glory. We saw his glory. We see that in verse three where he talks about the writer to Hebrews says he's the radiance of his glory. Jesus Christ is glorious and he's the glory of God. He says he's the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth, grace and truth. Who is God? Well, he's, he's the same God that was described in Nehemiah, a God of forgiveness, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. And so when John writes about Jesus, he's writing about the same God, the God who has revealed the Father, the Son who has revealed the Father, rather. He goes on in John chapter 1, uh, verse 18, uh, to, in further description. He says, no one has seen God at any time, uh, referring to God the Father. He says, the only, uh, uh, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father has explained him. So there, clearly, it's a reference to the, the begotten God, the Son of God who was born a man. Uh, he has, he says, explained him. 
I love what Harry Ironside said in his commentary. He says this, God is no longer hidden. God is no longer hidden nor at a distance. He has come down into his own world seeking those who have wandered from him. He has revealed himself in all his infinite holiness and righteousness and yet with all his matchless love and compassion in Christ, God is fully told out. I love that line. God is fully told out in these last days. God has spoken to us in the Son. Fully told out. What a great line. It says in verse 3, again, he's the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. The, the language there, exact representation, uh, it's uh, character, uh, uh, the, the Greek word there, it, 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 it's, we get the word character, it, it literally means an exact copy. It, Jesus is an exact copy in the sense of uh, an, an image of God, the exact representation. You know, um, just in humanity, it's, it's always interesting to observe, I'm sure, as you, uh, those of you who are getting older like, like I am, young people don't get this so much, but, but definitely uh, older folks, and especially parents, get this. Uh, the older I get, the more I, I, the more I look like my father, right? The more I look physically like my father, in a sense, uh, but then uh, just... Uh, just different things in my humanity, different things in my personality. It's like I'll catch myself saying something or doing something. I'm like, dude, that's just like my dad. And, and we're actually seeing it in our girls, too, as they, um, you know, as they get older. They're all adults now. But even as they do, it's like, you're just like your mom. You know, I see things in them, and I go, you're just like your mom. Or in some regards, sometimes, uh, usually it's the less flattering things. It's like, oh, you're just like me. Um, but they become more and more like us. And, and you wonder about, that. how does that happen, right? How does that happen? How does a, how does a person who's got different, you know, they're, they're a different personality, they're a different unique person, and yet they become like their parents in, in you know, in some regards. Um, it's just, I think it's just this. It's just through spending time. Right? It's just being together. Even, even as husband and wife, you know, Lori and I, this August will be our 29th anniversary. We, you know, we've been together uh, longer, you know, significantly longer now together than we have been apart in our lives. And, and it's so funny how in many ways we've become like each other. In fact, we joke all the time. It's like, I didn't used to be like this. Now you're like that, and I'm like this. I'm like you used to be, and you're like I used to be. And it's like, oh, okay, we're becoming one. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a long process. Um, and so it, it, it's no wonder, it should be no wonder, Jesus and the Father have been together forever, right? They're, they're you know, part of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They've been together forever, for eternity, it should be no surprise. And I'm speaking here now just, just kind of in a natural sense. It should be no surprise that the son looks exactly like the father. Um, but, but because he's a partaker of the father, he is God. Um, you know, theologically, it, 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 you know, the, the analogy breaks down a little bit. But it would be unnatural if they weren't the same, right? It would be unnatural if they weren't the same. Jesus talked about this in John chapter 14. Uh, there's always the question, you know, that the, the, the different groups had. Uh, and, and still today, you know, show us God. We want to see God. You know, God, you know, let's see a demonstration or whatever. Uh, Jesus just said this in, in so beautiful, John chapter 14. He says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Man, talk about a mic drop. It's like, it's like they, everyone wants to see the Father. Oh, we want to see God. And Jesus is just like, if you see me, hey, from now on, you can't say that. Think about that for a second. People who think, oh, I want to see God the Father. If you've seen Jesus, according to his words, you've seen the Father. Mind blown, right? That, that is just so wild. And so Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and it'll be enough for us. And, you know, Jesus, I'm sure, I'm, I'm, this is my translation here. He went, <sighs> no, no. he said, have I been with you so long 
and yet you've not come to know me, Philip? Again, he says in verse 9, John 14, 9, He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Right? He's like, I, I'm the image of God. When you see me, as you take in me, you're seeing the Father. Though, and, and this is theologically, you know, we don't completely understand this. It's, it's, it's far beyond our comprehension, right? It gets into deep, deep theology here. Because the Father and the Son are distinct in personhood. But as far as the representation of God, as far as the image of God, Jesus says, you see me, you see God. In Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes, He is the image of Of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. God has spoken. God has spoken in the past, and God is speaking now. And He has spoken in the person of Jesus Christ. And and, and all that, you know, if you if you look at this language, He's spoken, there's this sense that it's all past tense, right? Uh, he's got nothing more to say. He has spoken. And, 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 and in many regards, as far as theology goes, he has nothing more to say. This is one of the strong arguments uh, against, and I think it's an important thing to consider. It's a strong argument against some of the more uh, contemporary so-called revelations of God. There is no greater, there is no greater, there's no necessary uh, additional revelation of God. There's no Newer Testament. You know, recently there's been uh, books that have come out, uh, and I say recently in the short term. Uh, there was one in particular. I'm not going to name it. Some of you will know what I'm talking about, uh, but I don't want to have the controversy of naming the book right now. But there's these books that are written uh, where they're, they're, they're meditations in what God has spoken to an individual person apart from what this says. To be careful with that, right? Be careful with that. Uh, you can say all day long, hey, the Lord spoke to me. Hey, the Lord told me this, or hey, the Lord told me that. You have to be very, very careful with that because anything that we might feel that the Lord would speak to us or impress upon us is not this. It is not this. God completed this. The, the word that we need has already been spoken. It's already been revealed. Now, that's not to say that God does not give us direction or that God does not give us information relative to uh, an important decision or things like that. I mean, we pray for revelation all the time. We prayed this morning for revelation. God, speak to us. But what we want is for him to only make clear what's here, what's already been revealed, what's already been delivered. God has spoken. And there are many things that you have to be careful of in regard to kind of contemporary, God speaking in a contemporary sense. Paul addresses that in his letter to the Galatians, in particular having to do with a message, a further message or a further testament coming from an angel. He says this, he says, even if we, uh, this is, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 1 verses 8 and 9, Uh, Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed, anathema. I mean, the language there couldn't be stronger, right? This is the Apostle Paul, and he's saying, listen, if someone comes to you, not one of us, in other words, not one of the apostles, not someone who has been with Jesus or received revelation directly from Jesus, or maybe it's from an angel, he says, hey, don't, you know, if it's contrary to what we have told you, man, they're accursed. As we have said before, he goes on, and I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Strong, strong language. And the whole idea is, if it's not this, if, if someone's preaching to you a word that's not this or is contrary to this, run, right? Look for the exit. Relationally, look for the exit. You know, get rid of the book. You know, don't receive it. It's dangerous. The whole idea is that God has spoken. He's spoken to us in his son and he's spoken to us in the word of God, which we believe Right? This is historic Orthodox Christianity. We believe that the canon is closed. We believe that the Word of God, in the sense of what needs to be revealed, is done. 
Jude says this in chapter 3, or well, there's only one chapter, verse 3 of Jude. It says this, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. That's a very, very important verse. The whole idea there that Jude was talking about was people who would come into the church and try to say, oh, here's another teaching. Here's another revelation. Here's another testament, if you will, about the gospel, about Jesus. But it wasn't the one that they already had heard and received from the apostles. And so the, the onus there is on Christians to contend earnestly, fight for even, hanging on to the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. God spoke. God spoke in the past. He has spoken to us now in his son. And you'll notice if you compare the two things, the totality of everything that he said in the Old Testament and the totality of everything that he says in the New Testament, it's not two separate things. It's one thing. God is a God of forgiveness. God is a God of forgiveness. What they came to in conclusion in the Old Testament is the same thing that we come to in conclusion in the New Testament. Our God is a God of forgiveness. He's gracious. He's compassionate. He's slow to anger. And he's abounding. He's abounding in loving kindness. Have you ever done a study on that word abounding? I love it. It's just, it reminds me of Tigger right? <laughs> I'm not going to sing this song, but it just reminds me, God is abounding in loving kindness. Amen. God has spoken and he said the same thing. Now, now in our text, uh, you'll notice uh, as he goes through this whole thing, not only has God spoken, not only is Jesus the exact radiance and glory or the, gl the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and all that. It says at the end of verse three, he sat down at the right hand of God. He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. I think this is, on, on one level, I think this is very simple to understand. It's just very, very practical. Uh, you could just ask yourself this question. I will pose it to you. When do you sit down? Right? When do you sit down? Y y generally speaking, I mean, we're, we're talking generally here. You sit down when the work is done. Now, some of you sit down at the desk, do work. Uh, we're, we're just talking about in general, right? The whole idea is, is the work is complete. That, that's kind of just one of the, one of the ideas here. Um, and in, in regard to revelation, in regard to God speaking, there's nothing more that needs to be said. It's been said. It's here. We've got it. Uh, there's nothing more to be said. Uh, and I would just say this, there's nothing more to do. Uh, spiritually, in regard to salvation, of course, we know that God's at work in the world. God's doing many things. But in regard to salvation, there's nothing more to do. It's done. Look at, look at what it says. When he had made purification of sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, this isn't literal in the sense that Jesus isn't necessarily literally sitting down. Um, but it's a picture for us. It's a picture of completed work. It's a picture of salvation secured. It's a picture of the king on his throne. It's something that's emphasized over and over throughout the letter. It's repeated in chapter 8. Well, here in chapter 1, chapter 8, chapter 10, chapter 12, it's repeated. The, the Lord Jesus is sitting. We see him sitting over and over. Look at uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, just one instance where it talks about this. Uh, I think it's very instructive. Verses 11 through 14 of, of chapter 10. Uh, again, at this point, he's talking about the priesthood and, and comparing Jesus with the priesthood or the priest. And he says, uh, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. 
But he, now you see the contrast, now he's talking about Jesus. He, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet. For by one offering, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. That's the gospel, isn't it? That's the gospel. Jesus Christ, uh, at one time, he offered himself as a sacrifice for sins for all time. He's not like the priests who have to perpetually do these things, which at the end don't actually do it anyway. They don't take away sins. Jesus has accomplished that. And so what uh, the writer here gives us in verse 3, he made purification of sins. That's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. He made purification of sins for all who would trust in him, for all who would come to him. So beautiful. And then he sat down. I like what Charles Spurgeon wrote. So beautiful. Sometimes I read Spurgeon and I just think, oh, I wish I had half his eloquence. Uh, this is what, what he, he wrote in this regard. He says, not only does Jesus sit in the place of honor, but he occupies the place of safety. None can hurt him now. None can stay his purposes or defeat his will. He is at the powerful right hand of God in heaven above and on the earth beneath and in the waters underneath the earth and on every star. He is supreme Lord and Master. They that will not yield to him shall be broken with a rod of iron. He shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So his cause is safe. His kingdom is secure. For he is at the right hand of power. Christ at the right hand of God signifies the eternal certainty of his reward. It is not possible that he should be robbed of the purchase of his blood. Christ will have what he bought with his own blood, especially as he lives to claim his purchase. He shall never be defeated and never disappointed. Our Savior. Amen. I, don't, I, I just love, just think about that. Jesus Christ, he can never be disappointed. He can never be defeated. He's the king. He's on the throne. He's done all that, he's, that is necessary for salvation for all who will trust in him. And that can't be taken away. How beautiful. How wonderful. He shall never be, defeated, never be defeated and disappointed. He is our eternal savior. Now, clearly the language here uh, begins talking about how Jesus is better. Uh, this is where I think the audience or the recipients of this letter may come into play. The Jews had become, over time, uh, you know, uh, naturally, they had uh, become accustomed to receiving messages from angels and from prophets and from priests and kings. And the writer is now going to spend uh, a great amount of time demonstrating how Jesus is better than every one of those. Now, there is a tendency, even today, I would say, uh, to look for or to rely on what we might call lesser messengers, uh, lesser hopes. Um, I don't know about you. I mean, even while I'm totally trusting in Jesus, right? I, I hope you are trusting in Jesus right now, especially during this great trial that we're all in. And we're in a trial. This is serious. And, um, and we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, right? And so... Uh, in, in one regard, I think it's really good. It's good for us to kind of just um, really practice our faith and trusting Jesus in the midst of this trial. But I would just say, um, I find myself wishing for a prophet. Like, like, like not literally, but in a sense, I, I'm listening to other pastors. I'm taking in information from guys that I love and respect. And, and I wish one of them Right? I wish one of them would say, hey, church, hey, you guys, I know what's going on. 
right? Uh, here's the word of the Lord for today. This is what's going on. This is what's going to happen next. Don't you wish you had that? I mean, maybe to some degree, people are expecting that I would have some information like that. I'm sorry, I don't. I, I, I don't. Uh, maybe in another, another sense, uh, I wish an angel would speak. Right, we've got all these wonderful times in the scriptures where an angel shows up and, and gives revelation. An angel shows up and gives some prophetic message. An angel shows up and gives, says, hey, this is what God's doing. Right, or, or a vision or something other than like that. Um, I, 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 I wish, you know, on some level, I wish we had stuff like that. Even a king, right, even a king, even a leader who, who would... Um, who would speak righteously, who would, who would kind of just explain everything, uh, some source of information by which we would all just go, oh, okay, we're all right. You know what, friend? Uh, none of those things is happening. None of those things is happening. There's no prophet in, in the sense uh, of how I described. No angel is going to speak to us and clear all this stuff up. No king in the short term is going to arise and say, hey, you know, let me explain all this. We got this all together. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the revelation of God. And in every case, he's better. And, and so the challenge for us in our present circumstance is to hang on to him is to look to him, is to look to his word. His word, even in this present distress, his word is enough. He, as Spurgeon says, he's the king. He's on the throne. He's not going to be defeated. He's not going to be disappointed. He's not going to lose you, right? He, the, the, we're in his hands. He's victorious. He's the king. He's seated. Because his work of salvation is complete. Now, the reality is we, we have to go through this time. We're still in this time where we're waiting for everything to be revealed and for everything to be accomplished. But his work of salvation is done. And my future and your future, if you're trusting in him, it is secure. Because it's in his hands. What a great truth that is to hold on to. We don't need an angel or a prophet, or another book, or another testament. No, we've got Jesus, and he's better. He's better. Now, he presents this idea that he's better than the angels. He's better than the angels. We don't have a lot of time. I'm not going to go through this line by line by line. Uh, it would take months if we approached the, just this one chapter that way. But he says, he has a, a name... Uh, look at verse 4. Uh, he's become much better than the angels as he has inherited a, 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 a more excellent name than they. Uh, you know what? An angel is a messenger. An angel is a created being. A messenger, a servant. Now, on some level, I think we, we have a love for the angels even though we know very little about them. But the angels are not the Savior. Jesus Christ's name is Savior, right? He's Christ. He's not the messenger. He's not the servant, though he came as a servant. He's the Savior. He's the Savior of humanity and the King. He's not a created messenger, but the King of creation. Talk about a more excellent name. And, and so the writer, he, he asks this long question. It's a long question with many different parts to it. Look at verse 5. He says, for to which of the angels did he ever say, right, you are my son. Jesus is better than the angels uh, because he's not simply a created being, he's the son. The son, not just in the sense of the, the, the firstborn, the, the begotten son, the incarnation, but he's the son as in the a member of the Trinity. He's God in the flesh, the Son of God, God who became a man. He's so much better, so much better than the angels. And then he poses uh, all these different other ideas. He says that the, in verse 6, the, the angels of God worship him. 
right? There's a sense that Jesus is obviously better. The angels, those created beings, actually worship him. In Revelation, it talks about all the things that are going on in heaven. And we see over and over and over again the angels of God surrounding the throne, surrounding Jesus. And what are they doing? They're giving praise to him. Hagios, 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 they say. Holy, holy, holy. Right? Lord God Almighty. They are giving praise to Jesus day and night. Jesus is better. He's better than the angels. The angels worship him. The, the angels serve him. There's a reference here to the, the, the winds and the flame and these things that are types of ministers. They're serving the Lord. In verse 14, there at the end, he says, Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service? Yeah, the angels are servants of God. And again, they're wonderful created beings. But they're so much less than the Son of God, who's God in very nature. Ugh. He's the eternal king. Again, over and over again, he writes about the righteous scepter, the scepter of his kingdom. The idea that uh, there will be no end to his ministry. Look at the end of verse 12. He says, of the Lord, he's the same. His years will not come to an end. Jesus Christ, he is our eternal king. How wonderful. Friend, I hope you are, um, I hope you find yourself this morning in a relationship with God. Having a relationship with God in Christ. You know, there's simply no other way to have a relationship with God but through Jesus Christ. God has, as it says, in these last days, our day, our time, God has spoken to us in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what He said. He said the same thing, right? The same thing, that line from Nehemiah 917. He's a God of forgiveness. He's gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. When we look to Jesus, that's what we see. God's a God of forgiveness and he wants to forgive you and I this morning. If you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I want to invite you to do that. God's speaking to you this morning. In the same way that he spoke All those many years ago, since the time of creation, he has said in summation the same thing. I'm a God of forgiveness. I want to forgive you. That implies the whole idea of sin, right? We're separated from God because of our sin. God loves you and he wants to take care of that. He's gracious and compassionate. Sometimes, again, we... People look at the Old Testament sometimes and they just see a God of wrath. They see a God who's so quick to punish. No, God's serious about sin. Absolutely, he's serious about sin. That's what Calvary was all about, right? That's what the cross was all about. God's wrath was poured out on Christ. The punishment, the penalty for sin. God, as a just God, needed to punish sin. And he did that on the cross. His son took your sin and mine upon himself so that we might receive forgiveness. His grace, the grace and forgiveness of our compassionate God. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful, God, for this wonderful letter that's before us. The letter of uh, just reminding us of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who has revealed yourself to all of humanity for all time. Lord, we want to trust you today. We want to trust you with our lives. We want to trust you with our sin. We ask you, Lord, once again this morning, forgive us. Forgive us for our sins. Wash us, Lord. Cleanse us. Restore a right spirit within us. Restore our relationship with you. And Lord, may we be trusting in you. May we be looking to you. There is no hope apart from Christ. 
We acknowledge that. You have spoken, you have declared, and you have finished your work of salvation. We look to you and trust in you this morning. God, we pray that you'd be with us this week. Uh, bless our week ahead. Uh, whatever trials we are in, Lord, for those who are unemployed and uh, having difficulty financially, Lord, we ask for your blessing and your provision. Lord, we pray for our leaders. Uh, Lord, for our political leaders, for uh, those who are making decisions for our nation and for the nations of the world. God, we pray for wisdom. We pray that you would speak, that your word would speak to those men and women in power. God, we pray for those who are on the front lines, those who work in the hospitals and clinics, our doctors and nurses. We pray, Lord, for your grace and your covering. We pray for our first responders. Lord, we pray for, uh, for protection and for covering and for sustaining those folks. Lord, we pray for uh, your grace over all of these things and for every household for every life, certainly our own family. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Again, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, we'll be having uh, our lessons in Psalm 119 on Wednesday nights. Uh, those are brief. Love to have you uh, check those out on both on YouTube and Facebook. And uh, God bless you. Have a great week ahead.